Today, I want to talk to you about being armed by God. I don't know about you, but I need it living in this world. I need the armor of God that he works in our lives so that we can function in this world as his representatives. It's not enough to just be another human being on the, some street, some house, and there's no difference. No, folks, we are not of this world. We're of the kingdom of heaven. We're citizens of heaven and members of God's own household. We have our heavenly father. This world is not our, our home. Our home is with Jesus in heaven. Amen. Where there is no sadness, no crying, no dying, and no tears, where there is joy everlasting. And I am so grateful that that is so real to me, so utterly real to me. And folks, if heaven wasn't real, our salvation wouldn't be possible. Our salvation is only possible because Jesus is in heaven. <laughs> so... I gave you homework last week just in case you had the chance to follow up on it. Read the book of Ephesians, six little chapters. They are so phenomenal. You can read them all your life long, every day, and still it is wow. It is phenomenal. It is wonderful. And the Apostle Paul wrote that little booklet from prison. And it shows you you can be in dark times, in the natural, and have the greatest glory come to you. You can be going through the most difficult times in this world and have the most awesome time in that world. And how glorious it is when you begin to discover that, that we live in a dark, sighing, dying world where there is sorrow upon sorrow, sometimes more obvious like now than at other times. But folks, there's a lot of suffering in this world. And there's a lot of pain and there's a lot of hurting people and a lot of, and some of it, we, we just look at the Middle East or at the Ukraine or some of the other nations where they're having these horrific things happening. But folks, it's everywhere. So many households torn apart, so many marriages broken, so many people suffering with illnesses and, and so many lives ruined by just sin and the world and everything. We need a little light. I would say a lot of light. We need a little hope. I would say a lot of hope. We need some kind of an oasis where people can, oh wow, I don't know what this is, but it feels heavenly. It feels so wonderful. I feel peace. People don't know what peace is anymore because we live in a world full of war. People are now not just in wars where bombs fall, but political wars where you have whole communities against each other, or where you have racism, where people don't look at one another in love and respect, but judge one another by the color of our skin instead of the content of our character. Uh, friends, there is no racism in Jesus. It does not exist. All tribes and nations are part of his family. And I'm so happy that we here at Life Church represent that. <laughs> I mean, you look around, you got these people with amazing skin colors from different nations. We have more nations here gathered together than I can imagine, you know, and I am so grateful for that. That is Jesus saying, let all men come to me, all men in all the world, everywhere, in every nation. And it's so important that the church knows the word of God and that the church has the love of God for all people. I've preached all over China. Well, that's a big statement to make, but many, many places in China. And if you saw the power of God for those precious souls there, then as a church, we have a different way of thinking. We don't get so bogged down by the politics of things that we start judging people after some kind of political mindset, not as the church. Not as the church. And I know if it's your job, then it's important you know the rules according to your responsibilities. But as the church, we love all mankind. And we have faith for all mankind. Can I hear an amen somewhere? Amen. Just that in itself takes a certain armor of heart. It takes a certain armor of spirit so that we do not get dragged along by the spirit of this world. 
which can be very forceful and provoke you to carry its dark feelings and dark thoughts. And friends, we must not be like that. We must not allow darkness to have authority in our lives or in our homes or in our relationships or in our vocabulary or in our way of talking. No, in Jesus' name, no. We must have the mind of Christ. We must have the heart of our loving Heavenly Father. We must represent Him. Jesus said, as long as I'm in this world, I'm the light of the world. And I will join him by saying, as long as I'm in this world, I'm going to let my light shine. His light of life shine. That's what I live for in Jesus' name. And you'd be surprised how God lays his loving hand upon somebody through you that you would have naturally never thought to experience God's love with. God is able to break down every barrier that keeps man separated from finding him. And we must be those barrier breakers. How do we break them? By the love of our Savior and the power of His Spirit. I want to talk about how God arms us. You see, in Ephesians chapter 1, God begins to speak to us to show us how richly we are blessed with everything Jesus has in heaven with the Father that He now gives to us by his spirit. He now gives us his spirit of sonship, that we're no longer visitors to God, but sons and daughters of God, holy and acceptable in his love. Holy and without blame, there's the word, holy and without blame in his love. Do you know a lot of Christians don't know what that's like? <laughs> they don't know what it means to be holy and without blame. They live in a world of, of mixture of feelings and thoughts and desires. For me, that's an armor. Holiness and without blame. Nope, I'm not going to live in a spirit where I'm constantly feeling not good enough about myself and then being all defensive and afraid of what people think or say about me. For me, that's an armor I choose to live in. And so I pray those scriptures there, Ephesians 1 verse 6 and 7. I pray them, thank you, Father, I am your son. I am holy and without blame in your love. According to the riches of your grace, I have been made accepted in the beloved in whom I have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So he lays out this Holy Ghost red carpet for you and me to say, come on, come on, come on in. Receive my acceptance receive my love for you, right? That's where he begins, inviting us into his love, inviting us into right standing with him where there is no condemnation. And then he says, you in chapter two, who were dead in your sins, he made a life together with Christ. God has made you alive with the life of the son of God. Once like the rest of the world, you were led by the nature of sin, fulfilling the lust of the flesh and of the nature of sin. And you were just like any others, children that suffered the pains of wrath. In other words, you were spiritually dead. That's what it means, wrath of God. You're spiritually dead. The wages of sin is death. You were separated from God. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved you, even though you were dead, made you alive together with Jesus Christ and raised you up together with him to sit with him at his right hand. My goodness, I find the book of Ephesians so incredibly powerful to feed upon daily to know what God has richly and graciously given me in Jesus. I tell you folks, if you want the Holy Spirit to become active in your life, Read the book of Ephesians and you'll begin to see what is written there become alive in you, become real in you. And that you know, I'm saved by grace. Can you say it? I'm saved by grace. Shout it out. I'm saved by grace. You have to shout it out again one more time. I'm saved by grace. Glory to God. 
Look at your neighbor and say, you're saved. Amen. <laughs> you're saved in Jesus' name. What you believe makes all the difference. What you believe makes all the difference. Say it again, I'm saved by grace. Oh, hallelujah. You take that chapter 2, verse 1 through 10, and you begin to meditate on it. I'm saved by grace. I'm saved by grace. And then you come into chapter 3. Oh, God, who is rich in glory, now strengthens you with might of his spirit inwardly so that you may come to practically, personally experience Jesus Christ living in your heart by his spirit and be rooted in love, the Father's love. Rooted in love so that together with all the saints of God around the world, you may come to comprehend what is the height, the depth, the breadth and length of his love and become a body holy, filled and flooded with God himself. And God is able to accomplish this in you by his power far beyond what you could have dared ask, hoped or prayed for. I mean, it is beyond what you can comprehend. Friends, if you limit God with your little bitty mind, you will not know these riches. You've got to let go of your mind and allow him to show you his mind. Let this mind be in you, Philippians 2 verse 5, that you see in Jesus. Jesus said, I'm in the Father. The Father is in me. I am from the Father. I'm going to the Father. The Father is with me. The Father never, he had a mindset that God wants you and I to live in as sons and daughters of God. Why am I sharing all of these things? Because if you then go to chapter six, right, of Ephesians, verse 10, he says, finally then, not finally as in conclusion, but to take all of what I've just shared to you into what I'm going to share with you now. So in conclusion to everything I've just told you, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, trickery, schemings of the devil. One of the trickery schemings of the devil today, and I think a lot of the church has been caught up with this, is to forget he exists or to act like he doesn't exist or just never talk about him. So as if he'll go away if we'll not talk about him. And this is why many people have become so vulnerable, Christians, to all the dark influences of evil movies filled with witchcraft, hokey pokey stuff, all kinds of most unimaginable dark things, evil spirits. You cannot live this life without having to give an account of what you truly believe in your heart. There's always timings when the goats get separated from the sheep and where those that truly have the heart of our loving Heavenly Father and believe in his word and carry his heart because of his word and those who just are all in it for the right. But when it comes down to it, you see their hearts aren't really belonging to God. And friends, there are evil spirits that will push you where if you don't choose what you believe, they control you. And you get their thoughts and their feelings and you start advocating their ideas. And before you figure out they haven't come to give me life and more abundantly, they've come to kill, steal, and to destroy, like Jesus say before you figured out that you're going following the wrong spirit, the destruction has taken its hold on your marriage or your home or your children. And I think it is so important today that we allow our Heavenly Father to arm us, to arm us with this, I know I'm saved. 
I know my Redeemer lives. I know the price he's paid. And Paul uses that which was familiar in his day with the Roman soldiers there to say, have the helmet of salvation. It's obvious throughout scripture that we as saints need an armor because there is true combat with philosophies, with ideas, with influences, and with demonic forces that are seeking to destroy humanity and destroy God's word and destroy his influence on society. But as long as we are on this earth, we're to be the restraining force against those demonic forces. We are to be that beacon of hope that there is freedom in Jesus' name, that there is hope with those that come to God, that there is life eternal and more abundant. Friends, you're not going to find it anywhere else but in the body of Christ, in the temple of God's Holy Spirit, in the gathering of the saints where there is power in Jesus' name to trample upon these demonic forces and say, not in my body, not in my home, not in my life, no. And where we have the belt of truth, Jesus said, I have come for this very purpose to bear witness of the truth. In John chapter 18, he said this to Pilate. Pilate had a moment there and his wife had been warning him. His wife, you read it in the scripture, had been warning him. But he didn't listen to his wife. He was carried by the spirit of the world. He was carried along by the demonic forces. Even though his wife said to him, honey, honey, do not come against this holy man, this righteous man. Honey, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't come against him. But he got caught along with the spirit of this world. Come on, wake up in Jesus' name. Do not think you're going to just ride to heaven on a little cloud of ease. You're going to have to go there with the weapons of God in your right hand and in your left hand, with the breastplate of righteousness, with the belt of truth, with the feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Peace or you'll have war in your own home. You cannot go throughout this life the Lord shows without God arming you or you'll be torn away from him. And the Lord warns us in the last days, there are many who will fall away from the faith and give heed to deceiving doctrines. And there's always these winds of doctrine that come and they try to lull you asleep, but there's only one beacon of light that will help you walk free from those doctrines and it's Jesus of Nazareth, the son of the living God and we look to him and him alone and he is here to be the very armor, to be the armor and that we don't get pulled along and Pilate didn't listen and then Jesus gave him a moment there. I've come to bear witness of the truth. That's the purpose I'm here. And Pilate could have stopped and said, I don't know the truth. I don't know what to believe anymore. I don't know what to think anymore. I have all of this pulling on me, pulling on me, and they want me to crucify you and crucify you. And you're saying, I would have no power to do such a thing unless it was granted from heaven. I don't know heaven. I don't, help me, help me. But he didn't. He said, what is truth? And he walked off. You see, you don't see an armor in this man of belt of truth, of an inward yearning to live in the truth. When the Bible talks about the belt of truth, folks, as our armor, it's talking about an inward, in your groin, in your loins, an inward groaning of the Holy Spirit to know the truth. And that when you go through confusion of what to believe, oh Lord, your word says by your stripes I'm healed, but my body says, <coughs> the doctor says, but your word says. And you're going through a battle in life. You can't stay indifferent. You got to then decide, I'm going to live by faith in what God says and I'm going to appreciate the doctors and to whatever degree they can help me. Amen, amen. We're all for it because God uses doctors. But you have to have that inward Mm, in what you believe. And I charge you today, let God arm you with such an authority and power of truth 
inside of you. Because folks, we cannot detect a lie unless we're convinced of the truth. We can't detect it. We get pulled along, we get confused, we, we, and we don't know anymore. And before you know it, there's no more convictions. There's no more standard. There's no more, no, this is the way I follow. Yeah, but why, why, why aren't you? Yeah, but everybody, no, this is where I live. <laughs> this is where I live. One man who was going through a breakup in his marriage and he was filled with hate, darkness in his heart against his, his, his spouse. He said to me, meh, 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 that darkness came out of him. And when it came out of him, we were sitting in the car, he could feel me close up. And he could feel it and he stopped. And he said, oh, past all you ever want to do is love people. I said to him, I can't go where you go. I can't go there. Because no, there's nothing there but destruction and sorrow and pain. I can't go there. I've been delivered from that. I've been set free from that darkness. But you can come with me. I live in the light where the love of God is constantly shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. You see, that's an armor of righteousness. The Bible talks about the breastplate of righteousness. One of my favorite parts of the armor you would think would be the sword of the Spirit or the shield of faith. But for me to live in that conscious knowledge, peace with my Father. Oh, I find that daily. Glory, 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 hallelujah. And I know every part of the armor is important, friends. And God knows in what you're going through in your life right now, what part of the armor needs to be formed and fashioned in you stronger so that you can stand against that means it's coming against you and you have to stand up against it. The wiles of the devil. <laughs> and folks, it's very real. Not just coming against your home, your life, your body, your soul, your mind, but in society. And I believe a church that isn't a light to, to the nation isn't the church anymore. If we're to be the church of the Lord Jesus, some people say, oh, oh, pastor, what's your vision? What's your vision? You know, my vision is that the light of the life of the Son of God in heaven shines in and through us all to anybody and everybody around us and that people everywhere begin to see this light of life shining in our hearts and in our ways of responding and acting and that people may say to you, I don't know what this is when you get around everything becomes peaceful, everybody becomes friendly, and there's happiness here. Why do I experience that when you're here, but when you're not here, we're all arguing with each other. We all can't get along. We all just get irritated with each other. What is this about you? It's Jesus. Jesus, yeah, he lives in me. He is the light of the world. Do you see the armor of light the Bible talks about? <laughs> And we need this for society. Society needs it. We have a purpose and a calling as a congregation. I went, and I'll start closing, uh, in 1986 to Ely, Cambridgeshire, when we had just come to this country. And I had a week of prayer there. And uh, it was quite an interesting time in my life anyway. Monday night, I start praying and Jesus showed up and all hell broke loose. I'm serious. <clears throat> there was so much. People were all whatever. I, I don't know about this and all this is a bit too much. And, you know, who's this Dutch guy coming over here? <laughs> and some people started leaving the church. Seriously. From the first night. That was a good prayer meeting. <laughs> right? And then the next night, Tuesday night, it got even stronger. There came so much of God's life into that meeting, people started manifesting as in having darkness, unresolved offenses, hatreds, bitternesses, uncleannesses, and they all came, became manifest in the light, and more people left the church and told the pastor, we're gone. 
We ended up coming back. So I knew, okay, I'm in trouble. Listen closely. So on Wednesday morning, I'm up early, like always praying, praying. I said, Lord, you got to do something because otherwise they think this is me. But it's not me, it's you. <laughs> right? I said, Lord, you got to come and do something so that they realize this isn't me, this is you. And that night, oh no, excuse me. So I'm praying this and praying this and praying this. Listen closely. I've only experienced this one time my whole life. And the devil appeared in front of the window. What did he look like? I don't know. But it was evil and dark. I didn't see a figure. I just, his presence. And he said to me, what right do you have to do this? And it was so intimidating. So like you little earth being, nobody, nothing. What power do you have in the spirit world? And instantly, the spirit of Jesus came up in me and I said, Jesus. And he said, do you think they will be responsible? I control everything here. I said, yes, they will. And he left. You see, folks, we have a responsibility in the workplace, in our home, on the street, at the bus stop, in the shops to represent this life power, this healing, cleansing flood of the blood of Jesus. And you need an armor to be able to do it. And God knows which armor right now is the priority for you. Your faith concerning your right standing with me is so weak that the devil every time can make you feel you're not worthy. But I have made you worthy, says the Lord. And I want you to, by faith, receive this righteousness so that when you feel intimidated by these demonic forces that you're not good enough for God, inside the truth comes out of you. I know my Father loves me. That's that righteousness, that armor. Or when the enemy comes against you with a fiery dart and he hits you with so much pain of fear or pain of darkness or somebody says something and the enemy uses it to attack you, that inside of you there's this faith that stops it. No, I know what I believe. I love my brothers and sisters with the love of Jesus. I hold no charge against God's elect. God is it who justifies and instantly you snuff out that feeling, that thought of the enemy. We need to have a mighty armor, folks, to live in this world. That Wednesday night when we had our prayer meeting, the Holy Ghost poured out and all those people that had been so felt, so exposed, came running back and humbled their hearts and were washed in the blood and revival came to their church. We need that today. We need it. And God is saying, my sons, my daughters, I will arm you with my own righteousness. I will arm you with my faith, the faith of the Son of God. I will arm you with my truth, the spirit of truth. I will arm you with that gospel of peace that you come bringing peace and stop the strife and stop the marriages or homes or families being torn a shred. That you could stop it. Well, I don't know that kind of armor, Pastor. I don't know that. That's what I'm talking about. And that you have the sword of the Spirit. That the word of the Lord is in your heart and your mind to speak to, to those demonic forces when they come against you or your household. Me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Great is the peace of those. And that you begin to speak God's word and immediately those demonic forces run away. I tell you, you will never get rid of, of the devils by just crying and crying, oh God, help me, help me. Oh. You'll not get rid of them. That makes them feel, hey, it's working. They're all frightened. You got to stand up against them with the word. You got to use the word of God. And I tell you the truth, they will back off and bow to the word of God. We have more power than we realize. We can see God do something so phenomenal in our days that we can all say we have come to a day such as this for the glory of the Lord. This is why I'm living, for the glory of God. 
This is what I'm part of, what God is doing today. God is raising up a standard and putting the enemy to flight. God is raising up a mighty people full of his life and love, full of his grace and goodness and truth. Oh, I once was lost. I was bound, but now I'm free. Jesus is real. Jesus is real. Oh, I tell you the truth. I'm excited. Shall we stand together? Glory to God. Glory to God. You know, dear friends, when we started this church 35 years ago, there came forces against us so strong, so powerful, and they could not prevail but not because I'm such an amazing pastor. Virginia is such a, no. It was the Lord himself. It was the Lord himself. And I remember this one man and he came to see me and, and he said, oh, I, I hear of all of this and I hear of all of that and, and I've come to do something about it. I said, leave it alone. Leave it in, to the Lord. That battle is, is not ours, it's his. But what's ours is to do what he's told us and to just keep doing what he's told us and he'll deal with it. Uh, he didn't listen and he went into that darkness without the will of the Lord and he got devoured and he had mental breakdown. You see, we need to realize we need to not just walk with the mighty armor of God, but mighty leading of God and guiding of God and to know what he entrusts us all to do. I want to encourage you today. Say, here I am, Lord. Say it after me. Here I am, Lord. I'm yours, Jesus. I want to see you glorified. I want to see the Father glorified. Through you and me, Jesus. I'm yours, Lord. Use me for your glory. I'm your body. Purchased with your blood. I'm the temple of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for filling me with your spirit. Thank you for pouring out your love in my heart. Thank you for arming me that I may live worthy to the glory of God. I'm yours, Lord. Be glorified in us and through us as your church. We are here, Lord, for a time such as this to see your name hallowed in all this nation and in all the earth. We thank you, Lord, for your glory in Jesus' name. Now listen, Father, I pray for each and every one of our lives as we go from this place that you put inside of us, this yearning to grow in the armor that you equip us with so that we can walk worthy of you that we can see you enable us no matter what the circumstances are to be more than conquerors, no matter what the challenges are to see that overcoming grace and victory through Jesus in us. Oh, Father, that in the midst of circumstances, we can all see that your grace is sufficient. And I pray your grace, Father, upon each and every one of us, upon your household, upon your lives, upon your finances, your physical bodies, your emotions, your mind, your soul, and your families. The Lord bless you in Jesus' name. And everybody says amen. amen. We're going to have coffee and tea and some fellowship. And if you can join me on Wednesday, I look forward to see you. Thanks for coming, everybody. Have a good day. God bless.